titled Decolonizing Psychology and the Transformative Role of the Australian Indigenous Psychology Education Project. Before I introduce our speakers and seminar for today, I'd like to talk a bit about the Community Identity Displacement Research Network who organizes these seminars. Sidron is a multidisciplinary research space at Victoria University that fosters scholarly investigations of new diasporas and meanings of displacement and identity. It's a space for new questions about indigeneity, racism, transnationalism, sense of place, and social justice can be raised and discussed. Sidron runs these research seminars along scholarly work, conferences, and other events. So with that in mind, please keep an eye out for other seminars that we'll be hosting, as well as other events that we have on. Also, if anyone is interested in presenting at one of these seminars themselves, please get in contact with us or check out our website at www.communityidentity.com.au. Our presenters for today's seminar are Pat Dudgeon, Val Selkirk and Joanna Alexi. Professor Pat Dudgeon is a Bardi woman from the Kimberley, Western Australia. Pat is recognized as being among the world leading experts on social and emotional well-being and suicide prevention. She is a research fellow in the School of Indigenous Studies, Chief Investigator of the Transforming Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing Project, and the Director of the National Centre of Best Practice in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention at the Poach Centre for Indigenous Health at the University of Western Australia. She specialises in Indigenous psychology, mental health and education. Belle is a Noongar woman from the southwest of Western Australia. She is connected to her culture through her grandmother, Lila Hume, who has been a strong role model in her life. She grew up on, Wanda, on Wadandi Buja as a child, then relocated to Wajak Buja as a young adult to study psychology. Belle completed her Master of Psychology Clinical at the end of 2008, and her thesis examined the outcomes of a school-based resilience program for Indigenous primary school students. She was also the inaugural recipient of the APS Bendy Lungo Bursary. Belle now has over 12 years of experience working in the mental health field in a variety of roles, including clinical psychologist, group therapist, mentor, and researcher. Belle juggles her time between her family, being a mother, working in a private psychology practice, and as a research fellow with the Transforming Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing Project. Dr. Joanna Alexi is a postdoctoral research associate at the Poach Centre for Indigenous Health, School of Indigenous Studies at the University of Western Australia. She works in Professor Pat Dudgeon's team on the Transforming Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing Project. This project promotes and develops the social and emotional wellbeing paradigm and the importance of Indigenous knowledges. Joanna is passionate about promoting wellbeing outcomes with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples with the focus on strength-based approaches. This presentation today will examine the definitions and applications of critical race theory and decolonization in the context of the discipline of psychology. Decolonizing psychology in the Australian context will be discussed with reference to the Australian Indigenous Psychology Education Project. APEP is an innovative Aboriginal-led project pioneering the way in transforming and decolonizing higher education in psychology. It aims to increase the cultural responsiveness and capacity of the emerging and current mental health workforce to work effectively with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. This groundbreaking project also aims to increase student support of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander psychology students, as well as consider and explore the role that each of us play in decolonizing psychology and transforming education for the next generation of the workforce. Just before I hand it over to our presenters, I'd like to inform you all that during the presentation, you'll be able to use the Q&A function to post any questions for the presenters that you may have, and you'll also be able to thumbs up questions which you'd particularly like to be answered. After the presentation, we'll have a dedicated portion of time for a moderated Q&A session where these questions will be answered and discussed for the panelists. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Pat, Val, and Joanna. Great, and I'll just share my screen, Pat, on my end. Yes. All right, can everyone see that all right? Uh, yes, but you might have to go slideshow. Yeah, perfect, there you go. Beautiful, okay. 
Oh, thank goodness we're here. Look, everyone, sorry about the bit of a slow start, but we had big technology problems. I was saying to, I think Joanne was the only one who got in smoothly. So we were saying, Joanna, you're going to have to do the whole session yourself. Um, but we sorted that out in the end. Anyway, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, I was looking at the chat uh, before we um, we opened up the PowerPoint and um, it's wonderful. Everyone's coming in um, saying hello and um, uh, that which countries they're coming in from. So um, welcome everyone. Um, I hope that our session will excite and invigorate you. Um, but um, as the, the PowerPoint says, it, we, you know, out, we're talking about a specific project we're, we're doing, which is part of decolonizing psychology. And we, we think that it's going to have a um, big role to play in transforming um, psychology. We're all psychologists ourselves as well. But um, before we start, we'd like to acknowledge and pay our respects to all our elders, past, present and emerging. We'd like to also acknowledge and respect the continuing culture, strength and resilience of all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities. Also, we'd like to um, acknowledge and pay respects to all our non-Indigenous allies who stand by our side um, as we, uh, uh, as we um, undertake the struggle for social justice. So thank you, everyone. Um, we're all in this together. Oh, I sound like a political advertisement. But anyway, um, just a little bit about us. Um, we live and work in um, beautiful Nyungabuja, Nyunga country. Um, that is the Horton's map of um, Indigenous language groups. Most of you will have seen it. So we're in Perth and Western Australia, except for Belle, who's, who's um, uh, uh, in the southern areas. Um, so she's not in Perth. She's Where are you, Belle? Wadandi Budja. So it's about three hours drive south of Perth. So still Noongar Nation, but a different language group in Noongar Nation. Mm. So we all happily work and live in this beautiful Noongar Nation and we, we send our best wishes to everyone else who's, um, who's calling in from all the different um, uh, countries that make up our beautiful, diverse um, Indigenous Australia. Also from overseas, I saw someone ring in from um, Arizona. So welcome, welcome. Um, next slide. Um, basically, what we're going to do today is that we're going to talk a little bit about Indigenous psychology. Um, we're going to talk about our um, program, the Australian Indigenous Psychology Education Program, or IPAP, um, what's happening there and the outcomes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the current psychology workforce or Indigenous um, workforce, our Transforming Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing Grant, um, which is a, a NHMRC Million Minds um, mission grant. And our, our project is actually a part of that. So that's a, um, this is the second iteration of IPAP. Um, so we'll place it in context of that bigger grant too, which is doing a lot of wonderful transformative things as well. Um, then we'll talk about the development and engagement of IPAP too, particularly our community of practice, um, how we hope that we're a part of decolonizing psychology and education, but also in practice. And then we'll have time for questions and reflections. But basically, before we start off, I'd just like to put a bit of context around um, our conversation or our discussion that we're having today. And most of you will know this, but I'll just go over it in any case. As we know, Aboriginal um, presence or Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander presence in Australia is very long. We've been here um, between 60 to 75,000 years. And it's the, so we have this very rich culture and history. We're recognised as the old, oldest living culture in the world. Um, Colonisation only um, uh, occurred just a bit over 200 years ago um, when um, uh, uh, the British um, invaded the East Coast in 1770. 
and um, and for us in Western Australia, it was in 1829. So our 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 pro the process of colonisation is relatively recent in that um, enormous long history that we have. But despite um, uh, the colonisation that has impacted on Indigenous people, not just us, but across the world, um, we have survived, and there has been strength and resilience. Um, so next slide. Um, we know, however, some of the impacts of colonisation was to deny that the land belonged to us. So there was a proclamation of terra nullius. So um, that was put into um, the law that the land belonged to no one. Um, invasion followed, leading to frontier wars and genocide, the forced removal of Aboriginal people from their countries, the dispossession um, from the land. Um, after that, um, assimilation policies, including the stolen generations, were enacted on all Aboriginal people. And I've actually, and that's relatively recent too. It, um, I have access to my um, my grandmother's native welfare records, and um, you can see the histories there. It's in my living um, memory of my grandmother and um, and her generation being um, put under assimilation policies, having to ask to you know for simple human rights. So so it's not that far away from our present day. We're still not recognised. Um, a treaty is required. But we know that uh, that impact of colonisation, that we as a nation need to, um, we, we're in a process of recovery and healing and reclaiming our culture. Um, however, there's um, uh, one of the good things about Indigenous Australia is that well, there's always surveys about our well-being, health and well-being. So we know that um, there's a massive gap between the um, health and well-being of Indigenous people versus non-Indigenous people, hence closing the gap um, campaigns and close the gap uh, uh, government um, processes. So I think the right policies are now being put into place that can address those disparities. But we know, for instance, that the suicide rates are, are, are twice as high for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people than other Australians. Um, if you break that, that down into age groups or region, you get even a more bleak picture. So that's one of our big issues. Um, we know that there's been measurements of psychological distress and Aboriginal people um, experience um, much higher rates of psychological um, distress than other people. We know that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth almost two and three experience significant stresses or um, and or adverse life events. And for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander youth, one in three report tr being treated differently because of their race. So um, these are, are the realities and ongoing um, challenges to Indigenous wellbeing. Um, so that's the context we're working in. And I guess why we, we, we do mention those rather negative statistics, but they are a reality for our people is that we do need change. And so anything we do, um, particularly in psychology is really important. Um, psychology until recently have, has not included indigenous people or any people from culturally different backgrounds. So um, we love the um, uh, American Psychological Association. We're part of that task, um, part of the group under the task force, but they have a great definition of what an Indigenous psychology, and that means an, a decolonizing psychology looks like. And they say, which we subscribe to, that an Indigenous psychology is an intellectual movement across the globe based on the following factors, that it has to be a reaction against colonization and the hegemony of Western psychology. That secondly, there's a need for non-Western cultures to solve their local problems through an indigenous practice and applications. Thirdly, there is a need for non-Western culture to recognize itself in the constructs and practices of psychology. And fourth, the, the, the need to use indigenous philosophies and concepts to generate theories of global discourse. So that really resonated to, um, with us because it draws from indigenous ways of doing, being, 
um, knowing, being and doing. It also considers the role of colonisation and how that has contemporary impacts. It's informed by self-determination and engages in culturally responsible, responsive, safe principles and practice. And it involves decolonising research methodologies, including um, methodologies that we've used, such as Aboriginal participatory action research. Um, for us, um, particularly, we we feel that, you know, the models that we're or paradigms that we're now developing, such as social emotional well-being, are more suited for Indigenous people and probably non-Indigenous people as well. Um, whatever we do in, in Indigenous areas, whether it's in psychology, justice or whatever, I think that it's important to hark back to the um, to the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous uh, uh, the Rights of Indigenous People. So two articles in particular are important to the work we do in Indigenous psychology, and that's our right to self determination, and um, and the right to have autonomy and self government in matters relating to our internal and local affairs. So the research work we do we do in development developing Indigenous um, frameworks or models is with local communities and those principles inform all the work that we do. Um, a little bit about social emotional well-being um, as a paradigm in Indigenous psychology and, and part of the decolonising element is um, we've been um, working and doing a lot of work in the Transforming Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing Grant, working with Aboriginal communities, um, both local, state and nationally, um, looking at um, a different, um, I don't know, conceptualisation of selfhood. Um, and we find that uh, a social emotional wellbeing approach is much more suited for Aboriginal people because, um, previous uh, uh, theories of psychology haven't suited us well. Um, so if you look at an Aboriginal um, conception of selfhood, um, if you have the self in the middle, that's, you know, uh, the individual, but we're made up of our, our connection to our body and behaviours and our connection to our mind and emotion. So then it departs from a Western model, but because we're also, what's important for us is our connection to our family and kinship. So very important, our connection to our community, our connection to our culture, our connection to our country and land, and our connection to our spirit, spirituality and ancestors. Um, but they're not static things. In the background of that is a history of colonisation. It is the social determinants that still impact on Indigenous people. It's still, and the political determinants that shape our lives. Now, this is, while we're focused on this for a, um, as a model for Indigenous people, it also applies to non-Indigenous people. Um, but all fundamental in there is the, the concepts of holistic health, um, that health doesn't just mean the physical well-being of an individual, but it is the social, emotional and cultural well-being of the whole community. And healthcare services need to strive to achieve a whole of life state where individuals are able to achieve their full potential as human beings and must bring about the total well-being of their communities. So you can't take an individual individual out, do some kind of intervention on them without considering their families and their communities. Um, so that's what we're working towards. There actually is a big policy document, the National Strategic Framework for Aboriginal People's Mental Health and Social Emotional Wellbeing. Um, so we'll be looking at, um, at um, advocating for that to be implemented. Um, there also is nine guiding principles, which I'm not going to go through. I'll leave those. Um, this, uh, these slides will be made available. And we've also got a big list of resources, um, papers that were done in, in working with communities to look at social, emotional well-being and so on. So you'll have a great bunch of resources that um, you'll be able to read in your own time. But if I go on a bit, um, one just to signal too that um, part of our work, um, which in Indigenous psychology um, and decolonising psychology, is um, our, the way we go about doing research. Um, 
there is room for um, quantitative research, but we um, we we use qualitative research. So I wouldn't go throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And it'd be interesting for people to read the Guy Dewey um, statement because that talks about the best of both worlds, but um, for Indigenous people, both in mainstream and ensuring that cultural knowledges are um, valued and uh, and exercised as well. But for us, a lot of our work, um, we've used an Aboriginal participatory action research methodology. That's a strength based Indigenous research methodology. Um, we've actually got this rather deadly paper, if I don't say so myself, that you can all race out after here and download from um, our website or from Loicha. Um, we work, uh, our, our APAR works in genuine partnerships with Aboriginal community organisations to co-design co research and ensures Indigenous governance. So it's quite a deep process. Um, community feedback privileges uh, local voice. We generate locally led solutions and ensure that our research continues to align with community needs. So we found that APAR promotes empowerment, self-determination, social emotional well-being and decolonisation. Um, and it draws upon an Indigenous knowledge system and local and community-based um, knowledges are essential for community well-being and need to be valued and um, has presence. My swirly hand is um, is like next slide. Um, so the the key um, elements of an APAR approach and other approaches as well um, is that there needs to be self determination. There needs to be Aboriginal leadership and Indigenous governance. We need to include the community as um, co-researchers. We need to co-design with community and local, um, with the community and ensure that there's localised knowledge generation. Um, there needs to be community level feedback and dissemination. Um, and basically, if, if you know the NHMRC um, core values in working with Indigenous people, if you um, put those into action, um, uh, you capture all the, the main principles of doing empowering research. Um, we also use the SEWB framework and the nine guiding principles there. Um, so at this point, um, I've given you a bit of probably some of the work that we've been focused in. Um, I'm going to hand over to Belle now, who's going to take us to a bit of a timeline and then talk on other things and a bit more of the timeline. So over Wait, to you, Belle. Pat, I'm going to, before you sign off, I'm going to get you actually to speak to this part of the timeline. I'm going to pick up the last part of the timeline. And this is important. And thanks so much for all the context, because um, I really want to acknowledge you as such oh. a pioneer in this space. And I can see you know comments are popping up there as well but um love to hear you kind of talk to these first few bits of of our timeline because you were oh, a large part of this process okay happy to do so um i think for us um you know when we uh, we started um talking about change and how mainstream models did not suit us and the social emotional well-being frame, framework actually had its beginnings in 1989. So that beautiful diagram we, we um, saw, that was done by the Indigenous Psychologists Association. Um, myself and other Indigenous psychs, but we knew that came from this um, huge history. Um, we didn't pop it out of our own heads. Um, it actually comes from a significant history where Aboriginal health um, leaders in health and well-being um, met and talk, discussed um, issues back in 1989 and said that um, there needed to be a change. We needed to have holistic health, mental health, and so on. Um, uh, after that, Pat Swan and Bev Beverly Raphael did the Ways Forward report. Now, that's a Bible in the area, and I actually was a part of that, so that's telling me age as well. Um, so I was part of the national consultations, and the first ever um, Indigenous mental health, if you like, conference that was held in Sydney. So that formed the Ways Forward Report, which is our Bible, um, and which the social emotional being framework is is um, extracted from, and all our social emotional well being work from then on uh, has its roots in the Ways Forward Report. 
basically for Australia. So what we do as individuals um, in our, uh, our work, our universities, our studies is not un disconnected from what's happening out there in terms of politics and, and, and society. So for the big significant um, dates for us, is that um, in 2001, there was a push for reconciliation. So to bring us together um, as Indigenous and non-Indigenous um, people, and that was significant. Some people say, oh, you know, it was a bit, um, bit tame and didn't really, you know, uh, address the issues, but it started a process where a lot of organisations and people started thinking of reconciliation action plans and so on. So that, that was the, the beginning of a change as well. Um, in 2007, the first national strategic framework for mental health and social emotional wellbeing was, um, was uh, developed. It was brilliant, but it was never implemented. Regardless, the movement had um, started. So I think a lot of, um, particularly the uh, Aboriginal community control sector, um, social emotional wellbeing is a big issue. So even though formally it was never implemented, I think it signaled the start of a, of a different approach to Indigenous mental health and wellbeing. Um, in 2007, the United Nations Declaration was made. In 2007 as well, Close the Gap started. Um, so, you know, there was um, the good measurements that were in place looked at the differences between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, hence, um, and saw the gap in health mainly, but later we see that gap in mental health and well-being. Um, IEPA, the Australian Indigenous Psychologists Association, was founded in 2008. And in 2008, too importantly, the Australian Psychological, uh, the Australian Psychological Society, um, oh no, no, we're late, I beg your pardon, I jump ahead of myself, I was thinking that was a bit too early. There was a national apology um, given to um, uh, those members of the stolen generations by the government of Australia. That was a significant moment. I can still remember that. I think, um, you know, for, for uh, that dark period of history to be acknowledged and an apology given um, was an important milestone. And I, yeah, it was just an important milestone. I still remember that. Um, later on, I, I, um, I uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Bell will talk about the APS apology too, because I think that's part of um, righting the wrongs of, of what's happened in history. But um, after, um, so I'll pause there, the national apology, and pass it over to Bell and Joanna. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, I, forgive me for looping you back in, but it was really important that I think that you spoke to that history um, and all of this context is actually really, really important to understanding uh, the discipline of psychology in Australia. And you can really get that, uh, uh, get that sense from looking at that timeline and hearing from, from you, Pat, and all this you know, foundational work that you've done, that this is a re really important part of social justice. So well, Joe and I will be speaking more about the, the about the APEP um, and that will give context. So all the context that Pat has provided gives context to, to why this project is, um, has come about and why it continues to be a really, really important project in psychology in Australia. So APEP stands for the Australian Indigenous Psychology Education Process uh, Project. Uh, back in 2013, uh, led by Pat and team, was the first iteration of that project. And that was really in the recognition that there is little to no Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges in higher education. And a lot of the content of what was being taught in university psychology courses was very much from that colonial uh, Eurocentric deficit standpoint. Um, and very, very little acknowledgement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander worldviews and knowledge systems and conceptualizations of, of health and, and well-being, such as you know, social and emotional well-being, which we saw in earlier slides. This has huge flow-on effects. Um, it means that Aboriginal voices are not, um, not promoted and privileged in the discipline of psychology. It has flow-on effects to um, how uh, people in psychology workforce are interfacing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It impacts on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students' experiences 
coming into university wanting to study psychology. So not, ha not having that cultural frame of reference when they're engaging in, in the material. Um, not being able to translate what they're learning at the university level to their own communities has flown effects to non-Indigenous students. They're not learning um, these other worldviews or uh, conceptualizations of health and well-being. Um, and uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, they're entering then into the workforce, really lacking those skills and, and expertise on how to work culturally appropriately in a psychology space. So this was a very important, I'll get you to just kind of go back. So this is a very important part of um, the first iteration of APEP. So it is to really um, uh, address that underrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices and peoples in the, the field and discipline of psychology. And in particular, um, really targeting uh, cultural responsiveness in psychology curriculum. Thanks, Jeff. So from that, from the first iteration of APEP, three key documents um, were produced. These were uh, published in 2016. Um, they are still extremely relevant today, and there is um, really broad policy implications. I'll talk about the three um, the, the three frameworks. You can um, access these and download them from the APEP website. And um, I know Chris has put that link uh, in the chat, but it's also at the end of the slides. Um, please do have a look at these frameworks, um, whether you're in an education space or work in the workforce, um, there's really good information there that you can integrate into your practice. So the first of the documents was the APEP curriculum framework, and that was directly looking at um, Indigenous knowledges and how that's embedded in psychology uh, curriculums at both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Um, the second key document was the guidelines for increasing the recruitment, retention and graduation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. So, so looking at um, the number of students kind of coming into uh, psychology courses, their experiences during, um, during their education, and also progressing to the levels. So from, from that undergraduate to honours to, to postgraduate and, and beyond. So really getting that, getting that um, successful experience through their, their um, education career. The final document um, is the APEC Workforce Capability Framework. And that was really looking at the, the workforce. So what core capabilities do people, um, whether it's uh, graduates of psychology or registered psychologists, need to be able to work effectively with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and community? Now, one really important kind of um, what I want to land on here is, um, and I said that these documents had um, really broad implications for policy um, uh, application. So in 2019, the Australian Psychology Accreditation Council, um, working from, from these frameworks, um, embedded a new standard um, around cultural responsiveness. So what this meant is all higher education providers that had a, a accredited psychology program had to demonstrate how they were working towards cultural responsiveness in, uh, in their curriculum, but also just in, in their, with, you know, within their uh, school and interfacing with, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. This is really important. So this, this was a huge shift in, in, that, in, in the timeline. So that meant that it went from it being uh, discretionary on, on each higher education provider in terms of you know, what they're doing to actually it now being a necessary. Okay. We'll go to the next slide. Thanks, Joe. So why is it necessary? So this is really important. So we, we have estimates that um, there are about 40,000 uh, psychologists in Australia. Now, Joe, can I clarify, is this registered psychologists? 40,000 registered psychologists in Australia, I believe? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Because um, I think that that is, that's came from um, APRA. So we've got about 40,000 uh, uh, registered psychologists in Australia. Um, and of that, um, less than 1% of those registered psychologists are, are identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. 
So when we look at the, I guess the, the proportionate stats of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the population, which is about 3.3%, that's a huge disparity. So we're needing to look at really engaging um, successfully over more than a thousand more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, psychologists in the community to, to reach that parity. Something like the APEC accreditation um, standard is, is really going to support reaching uh, these desirable targets. So with, these, with this in mind, um, the APEP 2, so the second iteration of APEP um, was, was on the agenda. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. So let's go to the next slide. So let's come back to that the timeline and 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 pick up from I guess from that first iteration of, of APEP. So since that since the first iteration, there's been further really important movements that's been happening throughout Australia, but also in the psychology space. Um, so worth noting. Uh, so we have Guy Dewey Proud Proud Spirit Australia Declaration in 2015, and that was. Um, and they're doing you know, really phenomenal work around um, bringing cultural inclusiveness into mainstream mental health services. Um, two, uh, 2016, as Pat mentioned, was the APS apology to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Very, very important. And that, for me, that really represented a, a deep acknowledgement of uh, the role psychology has had in the marginalisation of Aboriginal voices and Aboriginal people and communities. And that psychology as a discipline um, has, has, has to account for that and acknowledge that and plays a role in, in reconciliation and, and moving forward. And as Pat will say, um, uh, the APS was the first discipline to come out strong and do that and really was um, a leader in, in um, doing that apology. Um, we also have in 2017, the renewal of the National Strategic Framework of, uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Mental Health and Social and Emotional Wellbeing. Um, that National Strategic Framework hasn't been implemented as such, but the, the framework itself is actually is, uh, and I also encourage you to go back and, and have a look at it yourself. So that's this blue one here. Because um, it really um, is a useful document in, um, uh, uh, articulating the uh, SEWB conceptualizations and how to implement that into policy and practice. 2019 was when the new APEC accreditation standard came in. That was a very important point, uh, moment. Um, and then adding on top of that um, in 2020, when the APS came out and did their Black Lives Matters um, statement um, around anti-racism. So again, it's our um, psychology bo bodies um, really stepping it up in, re in, in, in doing recognition and action um, towards decolonizing policies and practices in the psychology space. 2020, we had the um, national agreement around uh, closing the gap targets um, and really systematically addressing um, very important targets. And then in 2020 is the second iteration of um, APEP2. And that's what we're really going to be focusing on. But before we go on to the next slide, I guess the, the context of what I want to kind of illustrate here is you can see all the way back from you know, what, what Pat was saying is that there's been this um, progressive social change that's been happening over a long, long time. And we can see in this last half of, of um, the, the timeline here that um, there's movement happening in the psychology space that's actually really, really important. And, and no longer are we wanting to um, accept, um, I guess, uh, uh, systems that are, that are leading to ongoing uh, oppression and discrimination. So this context is important as to why APEP2 um, is a very um, important project right now. So it's pretty exciting times. Let's go to the next one. So the um, APEP2 was revitalised under the Transforming Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing Grant, uh, which both Pat, Joe and I 
um, work under Pat uh, under Pat's leadership, and we'll talk more about this project. Um, in, really encourage you to have a look at the website, and that's also going to be included um, in our resource list at the end. So this is a really uh, groundbreaking, innovative uh, research grant um, that has very strong Aboriginal leadership um, and governance and really looking at um, transforming how mental health care is, is, um, uh, is taking place within Australia and really coming back to um, cultural conceptualizations of, of health and well-being and mental well-being for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. There's three core streams. So we have empowering access, um, empowering workforce, empowering service systems, and we also have the hub. Um, the APEC project falls in the empowering workforce stream. And that's what we'll, we'll be talking about a bit more. Here is our Transforming Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing team. We have, a, I always say, our three very deadly, very strong matriarchs. Um, we have Professor Pat Dudgeon, Professor Helen Milroy, and Professor Jill Milroy. Uh, we have a very diverse and experienced research team um, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers and scholars, as well as non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander allies. Um, so it's a very strong team. We have um, some really amazing uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander partners um, that are very uh, important in this process. For example, National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, Gaia Dewey, um, the Australian Indigenous Psychological Association, Healing Foundation, just to name a few. So these are our partners that we work with collaboratively and also forms part of our Indigenous governance, which is just so, so, so important in this process. All right, so now we're actually going to get into the nitty gritty of the second iteration of APEP2. I'm going to let Jo do a bit of the, the talking to this and you'll hear from me a little bit later on. Great, thank you so much, Belle. Yeah, that was a great segue into um, discussing uh, the second iteration of IPEP. So as Belle mentioned, IPEP falls within the empowering the workforce stream of the Transforming Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing Project. And so really, um, IPEP2 is working in partnership with higher education providers to implement the findings from that first iteration of APEP through a number of different initiatives, including a big one, which is um, building a national community of practice with higher education providers to build capacity and to support curriculum transformations towards cultural responsiveness and towards helping um, educators to better support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander psychology students as well. Um, and so we've seen the numbers really double and just really just take off in this community of practice. We've got more than 70% of universities nationwide that have signed up to the community of practice. I think that's about 30 um, universities that are on board. And so that's been just a tremendous outcome. Um, and in the last year, we've had numbers double. So it, it is constantly growing and has been really great. And I will speak um, to the community of practice just in a moment as well. Another initiative and project that is happening within IPEP is a scoping and evaluation of psychology education. Um, and this we're hoping to distribute the survey in the next month or so. And this will really look to evaluate and understand how um, higher education providers have gone in actually making those curriculum transformations that we're talking about um, that were embedded within the APEC standards. So how are providers um, decolonizing their curriculum? How are they embedding cultural responsiveness within their curriculum? Um, how are they supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students? And what's um, unique from what they're doing to what uh, the Indigenous Education Centre at their school is already providing? Um, so this is really important to understand and really to get a sense of what are the sorts of enablers that have helped them to make this change, as well as what are the barriers and, and what are they sort of facing against that they need some additional guidance and support with. Um, so that scoping and evaluation will be a really important part of the IPEP project. Um, importantly as well, we're working with key st um, stakeholders and peak psychology bodies uh, within the APEP2 Executive Stakeholder Advisory Group. Um, so we're working with IEPA, the Australian Indigenous Psychologists Association, APAC, um, the Australian Psychological Society, APS, 
uh, the Psychology Board um, of Australia or um, CYBA and the heads of departments and schools of psychological um, association or HOTSPA. And so this is really good for that cross communication and, and cross collaboration and to ensure that um, the initiatives that are happening within those organisations are captured um, within what we're sort of doing and that they are also understanding um, the initiatives that are happening within IPEP. So there's that alignment between um, all of that work that's being done. Um, and so just a little bit more about the community of practice. Um, so the community of practice within IPEP consists of representatives from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander psychology bodies, including IEPA. So this helps to ensure that Indigenous governance throughout um, the project, as well as about 30 higher education providers. I think we might have a couple more that have just recently signed up. Um, and so representatives um, from these schools are people like heads of schools of psychology, undergraduate and postgraduate coordinators, senior lecturers, course conveners um, that all come to these meetings. Um, and there's a lot of strong engagement and collaboration in those meetings. We also, as I mentioned before, have um, representation from APS and HOTSPA. Um, and then within the executive group, we have additional representation from CYBA and APAC as well. And so these community of practice meetings are held once every second month now um, via Zoom and they're facilitated by Professor Pat Dudgeon. And so really the community of practice is about building capacity of educators um, through that ongoing sharing um, and topic discussions. And we have a range of topic discussions um, and they change sort of every month or so. Um, but really we've spoken a lot about the meaning of decolonizing um, psychology and what it means and, and how it looks like on the ground, um, as well as supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in terms of recruitment, retention and graduation. Um, and then speaking about the curriculum development and examples of best practice. And we've had um, educators come in and speak a little bit about what they're doing in their curriculum, how they've gone about making changes um, and sort of, I guess, yeah, uh, talking a little bit about those enablers and barriers as well. And that's been really helpful um, for others just to hear about and get some examples of what they can do um, and what's feasible within their means as well. Um, another part of APEP is really um, upskilling the psychology professionals and students through a number of different initiatives, including um, online APS webinars, and we did a few um, last year and hoping to do some more this year. Um, also sharing online resources. So the IPEP website has been revitalized um, and we put a lot of resources on there. We've got all of the original um, IPEP resources from the first iteration and also um, lots more that we've uh, since uploaded. And so that's a really good space to just get an understanding of decolonizing psychology, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander topic matters um, and, and professional development as well. So that's a really good space. And we've got the link for that at the end. Um, so you can navigate to that website. Um, we do have a mailing list that's part of the community of practice, but we also, um, if you would like to sign up to the mailing list, would also distribute um, information relevant to you through that mailing list as well. Um, so another part is also providing some one-on-one -on -one support with higher education providers, and I'll talk a little bit to that um, in just a moment. Um, okay, so I guess here in this kind of kind of little section um, going forward is we just wanted to actually give you some information about some practice principles that if you're an educator or you're working with students can start to think about um, in terms of your cultural responsiveness journey um, and some practical sort of tips um, going forward. So I guess at this point, I just want to emphasize that it really is all of our responsibility to work in culturally safe ways. And if we want a culturally safe mental health workforce that can work really effectively with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, as well as diverse communities, then we really need to train and to build the capacity of students and to upskill the current workforce that might not have had that education prior that um, students are now getting. Um, so just some I guess pointers and some, some things to think about and consider and principles are first really looking at building relationships. And this is building relationships with um, Indigenous education centres at the school, um, Indigenous academics and scholars within the university, but also outside of the university. So building those international connections um, and also building partnerships with local community organisations. So thinking about that as well. Um, another um, important principle is engaging collaboratively with elders and cultural advisors around a culturally responsive long term plan for the school. So thinking about the initiatives and thinking about that long term plan and what that looks like is going to be really important. 
And so within this, um, things to consider um, is the establishment of an Indigenous Advisory Committee that can provide guidance and oversee that process and that long-term plan. Also thinking about the cultural safety within the school and within the university and how that can be promoted within this long-term plan. We know that staff are more likely to stay if they actually feel culturally safe within their work environment. So that's a really important point to make as well. Also thinking about staff. So hiring Indigenous staff and what their career progression will look like. And really important is the curriculum change plan. So if you are making changes, it's really important to have that cross collaboration between educators and unit coordinators um, so that content isn't necessarily getting repeated every single year, but it's actually got that stepped progression. So when we talk about that, we're talking about the horizontal and vertical integration of content. We're wanting to make sure that as students progress, they're getting different content that's building on the previous content that they're learning. And that's across all of the years. So from undergraduate to postgraduate levels. Um, another consideration is just to think about approvals. What does that approval process look like? Have you linked in with the Indigenous Education Centre to get some approvals and I guess get the approvals within the school as well. So making sure again that content isn't necessarily being repeated every single time, but that it's actually building on the previous content that's learned. Okay, so another really important part, and I guess this is at both levels, is just to consider that there will be the individual educators process, so your own individual process of cultural responsiveness and going through that journey and what that looks like. So building the awareness, building the knowledge, having that um, self-reflexivity um, and that thinking space to really think about what kind of changes um, are needed within, within your course. And then there's that school level process as well that needs to be considered. So, and it's similar to what I was talking about before, which is around just making sure that there's that coherent learning across undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Finally, um, really important to engage in student lived experience and to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander psychology stu students through a number of different uh, entry pathways and progressions of their course. So here it would be really important to consider what resources are available to students and where are they getting these resources from? Do they know about the APEP website? Um, are there resources on the school's website? So thinking about those sort of resources for where they can go to get support um, and making sure that students are linked into the Indigenous Education Centre where possible, um, as well as thinking about the development of pathway programs and criteria um, so again, making sure these are linked into the Indigenous Education Centre so they know about and can um, disseminate that information, but also making sure that those pathway programs are really widely disseminated on school websites and, and through, through students that way as well. And really thinking um, about those entry pathways and how they actually support that progression from undergraduate levels to postgraduate levels. And Belle spoke to this um, before, which was really important. Um, as well, thinking about scholarships, uh, again, where those are disseminated, what, what kind of scholarships are available to students, are they coming from outside organisations as well that you can let students know about. And finally, um, a student reference group for input and feedback. So this is really important to just draw on lived experience from students about how they're finding um, their student experience within psychology. Are there things that can be changed? Are there initiatives that they would really like to see and that they can help to co-design? Uh, so that's a really important one um, to consider also. So we thought we would just give a couple of examples. Um, there's some really great examples in the Insight Decolonizing Psychology um, article that was released in 2020, and that has a few national examples, but I'll just speak to a couple of examples um, within our own backyard, the UWA um, School of Psychological Sciences. Um, that have been involved within IPEP and have made some really good and important system changes. Um, so just a few examples there. Uh, we've been working really closely with the UWA um, School of Psychological Sciences, and that has happened through um, representation within the IPEP to community of practice. So we have a few um, representatives from SBS come to those meetings and to, to share what they're doing, but also to engage in those discussions and learn from others which has been really good. Um, we've also been assisting with some curriculum transformations that are happening within the school um, and just providing some feedback around content um, and any sort of questions that might come up. Um, also, we've established a SBS yarning circle um, and yarning group, and this is in collaboration with IPEP2 as well. 
And so with these kind of yarning um, groups, what's really important is just to have that time to ask questions that pop up, but also that reflective time to just think about any new knowledges that people are learning. And just to have that sort of regular discussion and communication is really important. Even things like practicing acknowledgements of country and cultural introductions have been really useful, um, we've found. And also just some early engagement as well on a long-term plan for the school, which is important to think about. And some system changes that are happening within the school that have been excellent um, is the establishment of an Indigenous Honours student pathway with a cutoff entry guarantee into um, honours, which is great. Also, acknowledgements of country are encouraged in student and lecturer presentations. Um, and for student presentations, this isn't included in the time limit that they have. So this really encourages students to just practice um, doing an acknowledgement of country where they can. Uh, also, they've established a student reference group, and this is really um, being quite vital in providing feedback on student experience. So things like um, how they've found different content that's been delivered, what can be improved, what's been really good, um, and just linking students into the initiatives that are happening at the school level. Finally, there's also been um, the UWA School of Psychological Sciences and School of Indigenous Studies that have partnered on a mentoring program. And so this program links undergraduate Indigenous psychology students to postgraduate students with the aim of really enhancing student experience and cultural safety. And also just to provide students um, that are going through that undergraduate level to just understand a little bit more about some of the career progressions, any questions that come up for them, um, things around curriculum and courses um, have been really important. And so that has been a really uh, great mentorship program for um, undergraduate students. There are some national examples, but I won't go into them. Um, please do have a look at the InSyc article for some more um, national examples from universities, but people are doing some really great things. And it, it's, it's great to just get an understanding of what people are doing to give you some examples um, and to see what's sort of feasible within your school as well. So yeah, please have a look at that. The um, resource is at the end of the presentation. And I'll just pass you now to Belle who will talk a little bit more about some practice um, examples and principles. Sure. Also want to add that the APEP website actually has um, a lot of examples from uh, different higher education providers um, nationally. So there, there is actually quite a lot more information there too. Great, so, thanks. This, this last bit of our presentation um, is really an acknowledgement that some of you in the audience, actually there's, there's a lot of people in the audience, um, some of you in the audience are going to be working in the education space or, you know, maybe one of our peak bodies. Um, but then there's actually going to be a lot of people who are practitioners or registered psychologists or just working in, you know, the mental health space or the social emotional wellbeing space. So wanting to just kind of finish um, our, our yarn around um, or, or both, as someone's just commented, like myself, I'm a both a practitioner in private practice as well as in a research space. So just having a bit of a think about how to apply some of these um, principles um, in your own personal journey and growth, okay? whether, you're, whether you're in research or education or, or in practice. So to start with, all of us, um, we all need to have a genuine curiosity um, an interest to learn about Australia's history of colonisation. And this includes understanding um, the timeline of social justice events like what we highlighted earlier. Really important to kind of get that contextual um, understanding of where Australia is at and where it's been. Um, and then adding on that, learning about your local context. So know the country that you're on, know the, the language groups, um, know uh, no, maybe some of the history, you know, for example, you know, um, you know, the history of massacres in your area or even, you know, issues around, um, you know, what missions we are in your area, um, even understanding how COVID has impacted Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in your area. So really understanding the broader context of Australia as well as your local context. Um, if you're unfamiliar with, you know, with this, you know, uh, very imp uh, important discipline of psychology, which is Indigenous psychology, start to kind of have some curiosity around that. Maybe even put that as one of your professional development, um, uh, you know, your CPD um, with your registration body. Um, start to kind of, uh, you know, read some of the key documents around SEWB. So the 
um, one of the really important documents is the Working Together book. Thank you, Pat. If you don't know this, you should know this. As you can see, I've got a million little tabs in there. Um, so much valuable information there around you know, working culturally appropriately, but also SEW, uh, working in the SEWB space. Same with um, the strategic framework. So these are really good documents to be able to um, help us um, start to not just understand SEWB as a model, but um, how to start conceptualizing and formulating you know, in our practice from that holistic multi-dimensional perspective. And it doesn't have to be just with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients. You can start conceptualizing with this model with, with people from all walks of life and cultures. Consistent to the principles around education that Joe spoke about, um, really thinking about building relationships and partnerships in your communities, in your community. So maybe that is, um, you know, identifying uh, the local Aboriginal community controlled health organisation, Aboriginal medical services, um, knowing who um, the elders are in your community. Um, there might even be cultural mentors or uh, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues, you know, in your organisation. Um, if you're, you know, solo in private practice, start to put the word out in some of your, your networks to see who's, you know, who's working in this space as well. The key here I always say to people is start building these connections now. Start building the relationships. Now, don't wait till you have something pressing on your desk that you need to then uh, get some sort of, you know, uh, cultural advice around. Start the relationship building. Let's go to the next slide. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> oh, going back one. So making sure we have um, a collaborative community approach with um, both the individuals, families and communities that we work with. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, have you know, so much expertise in so their own social and emotional well-being from within their community. They should be, um, should be engaged as experts in their own right and, and really honouring that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices, experiences, knowledge systems has profound uh, espinological value that, um, that we need to bring into our practice. So when you're um, looking at best practices, um, we're engaging with people on the, on, on the ground to kind of integrate their knowledges and expertise, but we're also looking more broadly around um, where I'm gaining information from. So when you go to your peer-reviewed journal search engines, you know, you're going to look there to see what's there in that kind of empirical data. You might find that there's quite huge gaps. You're going to have to look in other um, more innovative places. So having a look in the APEP um, website around um, decolonizing psychology, SUWB models. You're going to be looking at some of the, the, the documents that I you know, held up on the screen before. We're um, also the, uh, another great website to look at. Um, we have um, the, the Center for Best Practice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention. Huge amounts of best practice information there for you, for you to draw on. This, this information might not show up in, um, in the empiric, empirical research articles, but the knowledge is there, the expertise is there, and it is um, of, of really good quality. Finally, to, to touch on, and this, I guess, has been a bit more implicit in, in what we've been talking about, but a decolonizing practice requires us to look inwards all of us, it requires us to, to have a stance and a willingness to, and, and vulnerability to have that self-reflexive practice, knowing how we're, we're positioned in, in relation to the people that we're working with, um, looking at what our, our biases are, and rather than seeing that as a shaming process, but as a, as a, as a growth opportunity to, to start to kind of shift and move in our practices. It also includes being willing to, to look at racism whether it's um, overt or covert, you know, in our practices, but in it, in the organisations that we're either involved in or associated with. So that's a really important part as an individual process is to have that reflexive practice working towards um, a, a, an anti-racism stance. 
Okay, so these are a few of the, I guess, kind of principles as individuals that we can take on. I guess I again want to reiterate um, the APEP website that um, we're always uploading new information there. Um, uh, so there's the APEP website. Um, we also, there's that Working Together book, and I can see in some of the, the chats, people were singing the praises of this book. Thank you, Pat, as our pioneer. Um, this is a, a, um, also on the APEP website as well. There's, you know, really lovely video resources, resources such as the Journey of Health and Wellbeing. If you haven't watched this, this is beautiful. This is one of my, you know, go-to favourite videos to watch, and it's, it's easily found um, on YouTube. Um, Here's an important list of resources. So we've got the APEP website, the Timwa website, the Centre for Best Practice website, um, our fact sheets, um, the links there to the APEP frameworks, the, the um, APA paper, the insight article, uh, Gaia Dewey declaration. So lots of really, really important information there. Um, we're also, uh, so we, our two social media um, platforms, if you want to follow us on Twitter. So we have our um, Transforming Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing, um, as well as the Centre for Best Practice in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention. Um, both uh, are fairly active with, with um, current resources and movements in our programs. So definitely follow those. Now, <laughs> to finish off and Really, the, the, the heart and intention behind I'm bringing this video at the end is to, I guess, just kind of round off and land us in a really lovely way. And what I love about this very brief video, this three minute video, is that it really does um, show just the absolute beauty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. It shows the strengths and resilience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but it also really shows what why we're working towards decolonizing psychology and indigenous psychology. It's because it's about building this, this really beautiful future for our communities and in particular our young people as well. So let's finish off here and um, that'll that'll kind of wrap up our presentations and then we'll go into Q and A. Great. And Rama, would you be able to share that video on your screen? I can do that for you. Thank you. Rama, um, I'm not getting sound on my end. I'm taking out just speak sound. Right. As long as you 
uh, as long as you're feeling love, that's all that matters in the end of the day. I see so many people trying to fit in, but be yourself is the way. Never care what they say, stay on your grind, and everything will be okay. Shoot for the stars, forget all your troubles in the day. Keep your head full of hope and your heart full of love. Remember where you came from and who you are. Culture is everything, and culture is life. So when I'm rapping on the mic, I bring my culture to life. We all destined to rise, we weren't born to fall So if you see a brother and sister down in the dumps Give a helping hand up and ask if they're okay Cause no family should have to bury their loved ones On any given day Amazing. Uh, you, you guys can hear me okay? Yeah. Thank, yeah, thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you, um, Pat, Joanna, and Belle. That was, that was really amazing. I think, I mean, just judging by the comments that people have uh, made here and the questions that we've got. Um, look, uh, right from the start, Pat, I think it's really um, the, the work that has gone into this, the history that you've provided, and I think the the way in which um, indigenous indigenous knowledge, indige indigenizing, and the work that you've done here, as as an example of maybe the the, the global move towards de de decolonizing, but the sort of decentering, the sort of work of decentering, um, I guess the the Eurocentric or the the weird Western educated <laughs> industrial <laughs> rich dem democratic sorts of so, sorts of knowledges is really important. I think some of the sorts of lessons, I guess, that uh, that 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 resonates uh, um, with 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 me also is is the invitation, I guess, or the sort of challenge to us in in Australia as a as a very plural place um, to understand, I guess, some of the sorts of significance of um, Aboriginal knowledge as lo locally, but also glo I think also globally, in terms of the ways of being. Um, that is being generated and that is uh, resurgent. But what that does in terms of thinking about our, our very systems and our, our sorts of ways of being here. So there's a sort of a, uh, a it, it's a sort of an agenda and a call that goes and reaches way, way, way beyond way beyond psychology. Um, I think the stuff that I, I think I, I put, uh, and the sort of energy that's been generated around that um, at this particular moment in time um, and, and history. I think res resonates maybe with 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 the desire for other ways um, to be in relation and and to work together and to think together um, as as people, but also in relation to country. I think and and just the the rich knowledges and the rich concepts. I think that you guys have introduced to us and how we how we appropriate or how we think differently about psychology in relation to that sort of cultural knowledge, I think is just just uh, amazing um, for us. So I'm, I'm just going to go to a couple of questions here. We've got literally got five minutes. I don't know if you guys can, <laughs> can, can see them, but one of the questions I think maybe that uh, speaks to, uh, I guess, what what are some of the sorts of ways in which, because psychology is, is, is a language, it, it has particular sorts of roots. So I think Ahmed has asked the question here about, how psychological jargon is being treated within APEP. Um, and I think it comes from the US, the question, and most indigenous languages don't have words like depression, anxiety, and so forth. So what are some of the sorts of decolonizing that I guess that happens there in terms of the, the language that's being introduced as well? Okay, I'll, I'll give it, I'll have the first stab of answering that, then I'll pass it over to Bell. I think, look, we have to, I think we have to, part of the whole decolonising project is to critically, um, uh, you know, appraise what's gone before. So we as Indigenous scholars, that's that's our responsibility. We have to always, even if it sounds good, we still have to give it a good hard look and, um, and see whether it suits us or not. So... Um, Again, like the Guy Dewey statement, which I'd suggest everyone to read as well, 
you know, the reality is some of our people um, will need um, mainstream um, ways of um, treating their, their distress. Um, um, maybe there's, they'll need cultural ways as well, but it's a combination of that. Um, I think that the whole term mental health is restrictive. So um, uh, we almost shy about, away from it, but that's the common and well-known term for, you know, your, your mental health. Um, but that, that, is, um, that is implicit. It's all in your head. It's not about your connection to your family or your social situation, your history and so on. So I think we, we do have to be careful of language. I think um, uh, uh, we do need to start interrogating um, everything and that's how people are diagnosed as well. Um, so there's a lot of cultural difference and nuances, um, but I would be would do it cautiously because at the end of the day, the well-being of our clients are is important as well. But Bell, Bell actually, I'm more of an, a, a researcher. Bell actually is a practitioner, so I'd ask Bell to make comment on that one. Hmm. Yeah, and you, you set it up well in that we do look at the, the Guy Dewey Declaration. It is about kind of that, that integration of, of, of different knowledge systems. I think where we are is in a really important time where um, for, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people broadly, there is this understanding that our Western diagnostic system, so our, you know, the ICD-10 and the DSM, right, we can't immediately jump to these diagnostic criteria and putting those labels, uh, you know, on our mob when they're coming for help. So there is a move away from um, talking about people's experiences with words like depression and anxiety. Um, however, in saying that, you know, some people I work with, they appreciate these labels because it gives them something to work with. Um, so I, I think there is, you know, autonomy in the personal experience. So we're, again, this is working collaboratively um, and with each individual's um, worldview on how to make sense of their experience. And then working with that cultural interface to, to, together collaboratively to figure out what is part of, I guess, uh, cultural expressions of distress that needs cultural intervention and what is something else? Now that's not gonna be in one session or one meeting, that is gonna take that relationship building, that's gonna take that time for you and the person narratively to kind of work that together, finding terms that make sense together. Um, maybe you're involving you know, other you know, uh, cultural healers or elders to make sense together. Um, I have had some clients who have been very thankful to label their experience psychosis because it helped them make sense of what, what was happening for them and that they weren't, you know, didn't do something culturally wrong or there wasn't something happening um, that's, that, that needed some sort of um, you know, cultural intervention around. So I think there's this you know, um, interplay between working at the person level and locally where we're at to, to figure out what uh, understandings um, of someone's experience makes sense. Um, you know, I think it just, I'm just gonna say in terms of my own process, you know, I trained in clinical psychology, very much had that Western Eurocentric training. Um, and I'm still going through my own process of decolonizing my practice. And I, I think that's just really real and human um, that, just being an Aboriginal woman doesn't mean I necessarily have all the answers or can predict the future of where Indigenous psychology is going to go. Um, yeah. But I do have my own kind of um, process that I'm working with with myself. Um, but I just want to put that there as well, just to kind of let everyone know that, that this is normal, um, yeah. that some of these big questions, we, we have a sense, um, but we're also kind of individuals as well as collectively working towards... Um, I guess, more culturally appropriate ways of, of being, knowing and doing in a psychology space. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Belle. Look, I'm really conscious of people's time and I'm really sorry that we started a little bit late. Um, we've, we've just done 2.30 and I know people have busy lives and may have to get to other meetings. So I think Belle, Pat and Joanna, you'd be happy to receive questions or for us to send the, the, the questions um, to you um, as well. But can I just thank you um, deeply for, um, for, for doing this? I think it's a really invigorating um, conversation and a really important one for us to have. And you're showing 
um, you're lead, leading the way in terms of um, getting us to think within psychology, but this obviously has much wider resonance um, because yeah, in, indigenization and decolonization is a much broader call for, I think we said humanizing practices, I think for different ways of being human in, in relationship. And so this work here um, is an example of how that has taken shape in a specific um, discipline, but with wider resonance, I think. Um, in, in terms of our society, at least. So, so I really, really uh, deeply want to thank you guys for, for doing this um, for us. And I hope that we can, yeah, you want, are yeah, you oh, that's fine. Get... That, I'm putting my <laughs> hand up, but it really was. Look, Chris, you know, I'd be interested because I feel like, oh, we, because we did have that late start. Maybe we should do a follow-up seminar in a couple of months' time, and then okay. um, we'll just assume that everyone's um, seen the presentation, but we can carry on a conversation from there. So okay. I, I happily dob myself, Bella. You've Joanna, happily dobbed, be that. yes, you've dobbed in the three of them. So watch I'm the space. Happy, we're gonna... You guys on the um, make sure you keep your eyes out then for. So um, we will have part. another one. Yeah. Yes. Okay, we'll definitely do a part two. So yep, we've committed to that. And I also just want to say that in a couple of weeks, maybe the 14th of April, we're going to have uh, Professor Chelsea Watergo from um, University wow. of, of Queensland, I think, but she's going to talk about rethinking the place and purpose and practice of critical race scholarship. So I think it will be a nice um, interchange with this pattern then for us to return to this conversation in a couple of weeks or a couple of months maybe not a couple of weeks yeah, yeah, I, look, I just I just saw months, I just saw Ballinger Anna's expression then when I said weeks but <laughs> <laughs> um, send us the link for Chelsea's um uh, yeah. session too we'll promote it and we'll some of us will certainly attend it we, okay uh, I'll circulate alert. yep as soon as we got, got that one going I'll circulate that uh, so thank, you, thank yeah. you everyone for participating. It was really great um, that we Thanks had so this much. amount of support for this. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Thanks thank everyone. You. Thanks. Okay, tada then. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>